بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد So this is a, uh, an office hours, an episode of office hours in which I'm going to answer a question about a reading list that someone asked me. Someone named Sajid Shams recently commented on my one of the videos in my series I'm, do, I'm doing now, which is complete and being edited and uploaded on um, languages for Islamic studies. He commented on the video on the Persian language reading list. Would you kindly read what Sajid Shams said in his question? The entire comment? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'll put it up on the screen as well. It says, Dr. Sayyid, could you make a reading list on the critique of modernity? Rene Ganon would surely feature in such a list, but could you suggest some more authors and books? Your recommendation of... Freedom from Reality by D.C. Schindler was an excellent read, but it had obvious Christian overtones. <laughs> yeah. So can you recommend books from an Islamic slash philosophical slash metaphysical perspective? Okay, I'll do my best, Sajid. Thank you for a really excellent suggestion. You are quite right that book Freedom from Reality is written from a Catholic viewpoint. Uh, so I have a huge number of books here, which I'm going to um, talk about. Um, on the other hand, I don't want this video to go on forever and ever, but um, I will talk about all or most of these and just try and keep my comments brief. I may not comment on every single book, but I want to begin by saying that many of these books would be considered or will be considered, are considered to be controversial by someone or another out there. So you have to understand that... Um, I am not necessarily advocating every single book which I say here or uh, that I necessarily agree with every single word in any of the books which I'm going to talk about. It's important to read and read critically. It's important to read widely and deeply. And I think that this question of the modern world, uh, modernity, postmodernity, our contemporary historical reality, the historical moment in which we find ourselves is a very peculiar one. <clears throat> and I would say that it's distinguished in the entirety of human history by being uh, the only period in which we have a civilization, if you like, or an entire way of life, uh, which has really engulfed the whole world, but which has as its very basis the rejection of uh, any notion of the sacred, of the supernatural, of the unseen, of God, uh, of metaphysics, of death followed by resurrection and judgment. In other words, many of the very fundamental teachings which we find in all religions, or if you want to say in all religious traditions, or simply just say tradition with a capital T. And Sajid uh, mentioned someone named René Genon. Um, he's someone who I'm, in whom I'm very, very interested. He died as a Muslim. His name was Abdul Wahid Yahya. I've done various videos about him, and uh, he's a very important figure. Uh, he was saying that, of course, his books would, would figure prominently, but that is true. But before we get to his books, Genon and writers like him, and there are quite a few, we'll talk about some of them, had this notion of uh, the cycles of time, a cyclical view of the history, and that we are now in the last of these four cycles. There is a, to use the terminology of the ancient Greeks, there is a golden age followed by a silver age, a bronze age, and then the iron age. And then in the Indian tradition, this last and final age of these four cycles is called the age of Kali or the Kali Yuga. So on this view, the idea of progress, a kind of uh, ameliorative flow uh, to human history is rejected. Um, now, this is obviously something which writers like René Guénon and others of what become what is often known as the, or referred to as the traditionalist school with a capital T, or the perennialist school with a capital P, uh, writers um, from this school, or who come under this rubric, are writing from a metaphysical perspective. But there are others who have looked at this notion by which I mean the, 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 the notion of progress from a historical point of view. And so we may as well just begin with talking about this book, The Idea of Progress, An Inquiry into Its Origin and Growth by J.B. Burry. This is a Dover reprint of the 1932 original edition. And I think it's not a bad idea to read a couple of paragraphs from here, from the introduction by Charles A. Beard. Beard writes, The world is largely ruled by ideas, true and false. 
Although a British wit has declared that the power which a concept wields over human life is nicely proportioned to the degree of error in it, only a sharp eye can discern the dividing line between truth and falsehood. Moreover, we often discover that an idea which is not in accord with historical facts may become true in practice, at least partially. And that is the idea of progress. He goes on to say, Now, among the ideas which have held sway in public and private affairs for the last 200 years, keep in mind he's writing in 1932, none is more significant or likely to exert more influence in the future than the concept of progress. With a few exceptions, ancient writers were imprisoned in a vicious circle. They thought that mankind revolved in a cycle through some series of stages. In the Middle Ages, thought and practice were cramped by the belief that man was a sinful creature born to trouble as the sparks fly upward, that the world would come to a close sometime, and that life on earth was not an end in itself but a kind of prelude to heaven or hell. It was not until commerce, invention, and natural science emancipated humanity from thraldom to this to the cycle and to the Christian epic that it became possible to think of an immense future for mortal mankind, of the conquest of the material world and human interests, of providing the conditions for a good life on this planet without reference to any possible hereafter. In due course, when conditions were ripe, the idea of progress arose in the Western world, and in the volume before us is told in clear language the story of the germination and growth of this fruitful concept. That's a long quote, but sums things up very, very nicely. So if you just want to look at how this notion that things are progressing, things are getting better and better, comes about, and how this fundamental shift, at least in the Western mind, takes place, this is a great book, a great place to start. Um, so one of the defining characteristics of the reigning zeitgeist, the spirit of the times, is uh, atheism. So there are some interesting books on the history of atheism, uh, but first I'll begin with this um, book called The Last Superstition, A Refutation of the New Atheism by Edward Fazer. By the new atheism is meant, of course, what's his name? Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, Ayan Hirsa Ali, Daniel Dennett, Victor Stenger, Sam Harris, these are the so-called new atheists. They first come into prominence. I think the term comes about back in November 2000, not 19, November 2006, Wired magazine, The New Atheism. This is an original. And Fazer's book is a refutation of this, this new uh, atheism. But if you, and he's obviously a theist, he's a Catholic, he's a conservative. And if you're a Muslim, in one or two places, he says things which are not nice, uh, which Muslims will not like. But uh, as I said, some people may find some of these books to not to be uh, to their liking. That's just the world we live in. You've got to have a thick skin. You need to read widely and deeply, as I said. If you want to just a, an atheist, a sympathetic account, <laughs> then this is great. Peter Watson, The Age of Nothing, How We Have Sought to Live Since the Death of God. Uh, and it's, a, it's, an, it's an easy read. It's one of those airplane books, you know. Uh, very nice. So you can get an atheist perspective also. Um, there's also this book, The New Atheism, Myth, and History, The Black Legends of Contemporary Anti-Religion by Nathan Johnstone. Uh, this is, a, of course, a different sort of account. But also quite interesting. To be fair to the atheists, there is more than one kind of atheism. And in that regard, I highly recommend this book, Seven Types of Atheism by John Gray. Also an interesting read. It's a small book. Easy read. And finally, on this whole atheism question, this is really one of the most interesting books on this topic. It's called God's Funeral, a biography of faith and doubt in Western civilization by A.N. Wilson. It looks at how, in the course of the 19th century, the um, idea of God becomes more and more you know, impossible as a belief for uh, many writers and intellectuals. And there's a high literary content to this. Uh, to this, you know, there's people like oh, he mentions many different figures: Herbert Spencer, William James, Thomas Hardy. Um, just choosing those at random. So another aspect of the modern world is the widespread alienation and meaninglessness which people experience. Uh, how everyone is involved in this grind of absolutely meaningless work and has very little free time uh, to think about anything really important. Uh, people are just too tired. They've got to commute and they go to this job, which many of them, which the vast majority, I think, really are not fulfilled in. They're making money. They come home. They're too tired to do anything. They watch Netflix if they go to sleep. If they're not Muslim, if they're, you know, not even practicing Muslim, they may be involved in alcohol, drugs, other forms of of, of um, dissipation. And so there's a complete and total lack of true leisure in this cult of work. And this is a precious little book by actually a Catholic theologian named Josef Pieper, or Joseph Piper. But he was German, so it should be Josef 
PayPal, I think. It's called Leisure, The Basis of Culture with an introduction by T.S. Eliot. I think I bought this for a dollar at a used bookstore. This has been reissued many, many times. This edition was uh, Signet Books, Mentor Book, excuse me, New American Library, 1952 again in 1963 so it's an old book so it's this whole cult of of, of meaningless work and 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 uh, exaltation of work and this idea that you know leisure you know you're just wasting your time or if there is leisure you, you watch the NFL or baseball or uh, you know nowadays people have all their 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 Facebook and their social media and their YouTube channels and blah 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 so this is a very interesting book like if we read it from the back of it it says here one of the statements from the New York Times book review is um, Peeper's message for us is plain. The idolatry of the machine, the worship of mindless know-how, the infantile cult of youth and the common mind. All this points to our peculiar leadership in the drift toward the slave society. Peeper's profound insights are impressive and even formidable. That's the view of whoever this was from the New York Times um, book review. So modern technology has really taken over uh, our lives. There's very much an electronic mediation of reality. And this whole um, dictatorship, if you like, this hegemony, this tyranny of technology is very nicely looked at in this book, The Technological Society by Jacques Ellul. Um, he was also a Catholic. From the back... Robert Theobald, the writing in The Nation, had this to say in his blurb. Jacques Ellul convincingly demonstrates that technology, which we continue to conceptualize as the servant of man, will overthrow everything that prevents the internal logic of its development, including humanity itself, unless we take the necessary steps to move human society out of the environment that technique, quote-unquote, is creating to meet its own needs. This is also an old book. This is 1964, Alfred A. Knopf. A companion or volume or a similar book has to do with the domination of propaganda, if you like, fake news, hasbara, whatever you want to call it. Propaganda, the formation of men's attitudes. Now, you know, he didn't say people's attitudes or person's attitudes. Uh, that reflects the time the book was written, 1965. So I find uh, Elul to be a very interesting author. Uh, along the same lines is Lewis Mumford. Uh, he has this book, The Pentagon of Power, The Myth of the Machine. Um... This is the second volume. Myth of the Machine is the subtitle. The Pentagon of Power is, is a two-parter. Uh, don't have the other one handy, but you can just search it on Amazon. So this is also a very similar kind of, uh, of book. So we have this idea then of the modern world. Um, and I mentioned René Guénon, and so we might as well come to him now. Oh, yes, that's a good point. Thank you. There, there's so many books here. As I was saying, yeah, about uh, before we go to Guénon then, about technology... And the dominance of technology in reference to Jacques Ellul and Lewis Mumford is a very, very recent book. Um, we are all familiar with data and the hegemony of data. So this professor at Harvard University, Shoshana Zuboff, Charles Edward Wilson Professor Emerita, mashallah, at Harvard Business School, and the author of In the Age of the Smart Machine and the Support Economy, is a very recent book, I think it's a 2020, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, The Fight for a Human Future, and The New Frontier of Power. Um, it's about the commodification of, 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 of data and, and really the commodification of, of all human experience because more and more as you live out your life using social media and various apps on your phone, everything is constantly being tracked. And I really think that this is, this is a brilliant book. It's a large book, but it's also a very uh, easy and enjoyable book book to read. So all of these guys, which we've spoken about, none of them is writing from a metaphysical perspective with probably the sole exception of what we just said was um, was Joseph Pieper. And René Guénon is very much writing from the perspective of metaphysics. And he has this book called The Crisis of the Modern World. I really think that if you are new to Guénon and you've never read anything of Guénon, this is the book to start with. The Crisis of the Modern World. This is the most recent edition and translation. There are others floating around. You probably can get those cheaper. These are all usually not very uh, affordable books, but that's the situation. His most famous book, though, which is not easy to read on this topic, is The Reign of Quantity and the Signs of the Times. Now, there are other books, other traditionalist writers, and we'll talk about, and I've mentioned this already in my videos on René Guénon. If you haven't seen them, an excellent guide to reading Guénon is this book, Prophet for a Dark Age, by Graham Ruth. Prophet for a Dark Age, a companion to the works of René Guénon. 
Um, Genon was is not an easy writer. I don't think he's a very systematic writer. And so Ru Graham Ruth's book, R-O-O-T-H, is an excellent way to navigate the uh, ideas of Genon because they're spread out over, over his vast corpus of writings. I think his complete works in English is 22, 23 volumes. They're, they're, they're not really thick volumes. They're all, you know, like this, this size. But obviously that's a lot. So among other traditionalist or perennialist writers, of course, we have Frithjof Schuon. Now, he's a very controversial figure. I have grave reservations about Shuan for many other reasons, which are off the topic of this video. But uh, I am not against reading books by people, even people I don't agree with or whom I dislike. And the the key book of, of uh, Shuan on this is probably a book he wrote called Light on the Ancient Worlds, of which I don't have my copy handy, but it's Light on the Ancient Worlds. There is a volume called The Essential Writings of Frishof Shuan, edited by Said Hussain Nasr, which is where you can get a good overview of his ideas. A follower of Shuan, Martin Lings, wrote this little book, Ancient Beliefs and Modern Superstitions, which is also a very nice book to read. Now, other writers from the traditionalist school who have standalone books on the modern world and its problems. There's King of the Castle by Charles Guy Eaton, or just Guy Eaton here. King of the Castle, Choice and Responsibility in the Modern World. This is also a very well-written, very nice book. Two more authors from the so-called traditionalist or perennialist school are Titus Burkhart and A.K. Kumaraswamy. Now, all the people that I mentioned thus far, with the exception in the perennialist school, with the exception of Genon, were followers of Frithjof Schuon. So is Titus Burkhart. A uh, good introduction to his writings is this book, The Essential Titus Burkhart. And then The Essential Kumaraswamy. Kumaraswamy was not a disciple of Schuon. So we have talked about... The perennialist school. We can try and thin out all the books that are piling up here. I've talked about this book also in terms of the metaphysical end of things, because if this is the last cycle, then that supposedly means the end of the world is just around the corner. You have to understand, I'm not saying that it's tomorrow or next week. No one really knows, but for a long time, people have been thinking that we are in the last age. And this whole question of the temporal end, the coming of the eschaton, if you like, is set out very nicely in this book, The Order of the Ages by Bolton. Robert Bolton. Robert Bolton is a Christian. He writes from a Christian metaphysical perspective. He is not a follower of Shuan, but this book is published by Sophia Perennis and a lot of perennialist traditionalist literature is published by them. I have talked about this book in my other video on René Guénon at length. So a couple of other people who are associated with the perennialist school. So there's this idea also that in this final age, at least for Muslims, there will be a figure known as the Antichrist or the Dajjal. And many people are of the opinion that this Dajjal is actually not just a person or a figure, but is a system and is the this way of thinking, this worldview that we find. And so there is a book, a very interesting little book called Dajjal, the Antichrist. This is the revised edition by Ahmed Thompson. Again, a lot of this stuff is controversial. Uh, I'm not saying that I'm endorsing all of these books. I want to keep making that clear. Uh, but this is a, there's a lot of interesting uh, reflections in this book uh, by Ahmed Thompson. This is Taha Publishers, which is in London, the United Kingdom. This came out a long time ago in 1418, Muharram 1418 or May 1997. A book similar in spirit, but very different in terms of its scope, is The System of Antichrist, Truth and Falsehood in Postmodernism and the New Age by Charles Upton. It is my understanding that Mr. Upton is attached to the perennialist, the traditionalist, whether he's actually a follower of Shuan, I, I do not know. Shuan is dead, actually. Uh, anyway, though, that's a whole other story. But this is a very interesting work indeed, and he followed this up with another book called Vectors of the Counter-Initiation, The Course and Destiny of Inverted Spirituality, also by Charles Upton. So... <clears throat> This idea that there are these very long cycles of time, that these cycles are separated from each other by various cataclysms and catastrophes, is also an idea which you will find in these traditionalist writers. And this Kali Yuga has been going on for a very long time. When did it begin? When does it end? These are all questions which we won't get into here. But just the, the notion of 
Cataclysms in History. A very important book called Cataclysm with an exclamation point, Compelling Evidence of Cosmic Catastrophe in 9500 BC by D.S. Allen and J.B. Dallaire is a very interesting book to read from that point of view. They are simply writing from a scientific, natural history, geology kind of view. They don't have any sort of metaphysical allegiances which are which come out in this book and this is a very serious book heavily footnoted with scientific papers uh, from, from geology naturals and other natural sciences a similar book along an, a, a book another book along these lines is atlantis and the cycles of times prophecies traditions and occult revelations by jocelyn godlin jocelyn godlin is a very interesting it seems to me traditionalist author although he's not a follower of the of, of shuan and company um, but this is also a very, very interesting uh, book. So that brings us to another traditionalist author, Evola or Evola. Before we talk about him, however, I do want to mention this idea further on related to this notion of the Antichrist, of the devil, Satan, uh, dark forces. And in this regard, this is a very interesting book, Jeffrey Burton Russell, Mephistopheles, The Devil in the Modern World. Now, although Burton declares his allegiances, he is a Catholic, he is a historian, and he is writing not as a Catholic, but as a historian or just of the concept of the devil. Mephistopheles, The Devil in the Modern World, is actually part of a, um, a um, tetralogy, four books. Um, so there's also the devil, pre pre perceptions of evil from antiquity, primitive Christianity, Satan, the early Christian tradition, Lucifer, and the devil in the Middle Ages. So we got all these fantastic books on the devil here. <laughs> if you just search on Amazon under Jeffrey Burton Russell, they will all uh, come up. So now I would like to talk a little bit about this man, Julius Evola, another traditionalist writer. He is not a follower of Shuan. But he wrote a fascinating book along the lines of Crisis of the Modern World and the Reign of Quantity, and that is Revolt Against the Modern World. It's extremely readable. A very interesting book. Again, Evola is, is controversial for many reasons, and there will be things here which people will not like, and there are other aspects of, of Evola and his history which uh, people will find disturbing. But I am just talking about him from that point of view, and I'm not endorsing uh, all of his ideas. Uh, this is a very interesting book, however, Revolt Against the Modern World. Um, he was different from Genon in the sense that he glorified the idea of the, the sacred warrior as philosopher king. The, in other words, he, he gave preeminence to the Kshatriya caste, so to speak, over the Brahmin caste and this whole notion of castes and life functions and so forth is very important among traditionalist writers. Now, one of my favorite um, works by Julius Evola is actually Ride the Tiger. However, this is a very difficult book to read. <coughs> you have to have some understanding of Western philosophy, especially Nietzsche. <clears throat> He's heavily drawing on some of the ideas of Nietzsche in this book. But if you have the patience... Um, I think it's really worth the effort. He has some very interesting uh, essays also in this book, The Bow and the Club. Now, I did say that Evola is controversial. This is probably the most controversial of these books. The three that I've mentioned, the, the, these two that I mentioned so far are published by Inner Traditions International, which is a kind of, you know, New Age spirituality kind of publisher. But this is published by Arctos. Arctos are not nice people. Probably, you know... Uh, neo-fascist Europeans and you know he has articles in here which people are not going to like um, he did not have a good view of black people um, and he had his ideas and I'm not endorsing those but um, you know you asked me for a reading list I'm giving you a reading list you have to read critically in terms of there's no really good guide like we have for Genon written by somebody else but we have Evola himself, in his autobiography, The Path of Sinbar, actually gives a very good overview of the books that he wrote and his writings and his thinking and what was going through his mind and what he was trying to achieve. So even though there are extremely unpalatable elements <clears throat> to his life, he nevertheless had interesting things to say on this topic. So I'm going to mention um, one final book by Evola. And, um, oh, I forgot to mention this one. Uh, this is another Jocelyn Godwin, uh, Godwin book. 
um, with reference to catastrophes, ancient civilizations which are no longer with us, and that's the it's a book called Arctos. It's also the name of the publisher of some of uh, the writings I mentioned of uh, of of um, Evola, like uh, Cinnabar Path and the Bow and the Club. But this is about the polar myth in science symbolism and Nazi survival. No, Godwin is not a Nazi. He's looking at this notion. He's actually a, a, a musicologist. Um, and has a profound understanding of, of medieval thought and so forth. But he wrote this book to talk about this notion that there was, and this is an idea you find in supposedly in the first yuga in the golden age, there was a kind of hyperborean civilization, a civilization centered at the very far north and centered on the pole. And all kinds of groups uh, took up this idea. And so he looks at this idea of the polar myth. So I said the last book I was going to mention by Evola is quite interesting because unlike Genon, he lived he lived far longer than Genon, well into, I think, the 70s, and saw a lot of what happened in the modern world. And so he wrote this book called Men Among the Ruins, Post-War Reflections of a Radical Traditionalist. This is also a very interesting book because he's the only traditionalist who really talks about modern political developments. Despite him being so controversial, people thought very highly of him, including Mircea Eliade, Ru Romanian scholar of religion at the University of Chicago. He said, Evola is one of the most interesting minds of the world, world in square brackets, war generation. He has a really astounding knowledge at his disposal. Hermann Hess, famous German author of Siddhartha, a dazzling and interesting but very dangerous author. So Evola, you know, he has reflections in here. If we just look at some of the uh, titles of the in the table of contents, revolution, counter-revolution, tradition, sovereignty, authority, imperium, personality, freedom, hierarchy. That's the first three chapters. Oh, no, so work, chapter six, the demonic nature of the economy. Chapter nine, military style, militarism and war. Chapter 13, occult war, weapons of the occult war. The um, blurb on the back, the description on the back says this. Men Among the Ruins is Evola's frontal assault on the predominant materialism of our time and the mirage of progress. For Evola and other proponents of traditionalism with a capital T, we are now living in an age of increasing strife and chaos, the Kali Yuga of the Hindus or the Germanic Ragnarok. In such a time, social decadence is so widespread that it appears as a natural component of all political institutions. Evola argues that the crises that dominate our societies are part of a secret occult war to remove the support of spiritual and traditional values in order to turn man into a passive instrument of the powerful. So, um, this is a very interesting work. As I said, he died in 1974, and though he doesn't directly talk about, you know, this political party or that political party in this book, he does have reflections on our modern reality. Finally, just to wrap up this reading list, you will find in these traditionalist authors with a capital T, whether it's Genon or Shuan or Burkhardt or Kumaraswamy or Hassan Gaiden or Charles Upton or Evola or I think I've yeah, mentioned all the ones I mentioned. There's a constant reference to metaphysics, but there's never a systematic exposition of what metaphysics is supposed to be. So if you really want to understand that, you've got to read the metaphysics of Aristotle or the tradition that comes out after or comes out of that book uh, emerges from that especially in islamic philosophy al-farabi ibn sina and then people who build on that you know people like mullah sadra very important i would say suhrawardi is also very important you want to understand metaphysics but all these books are uh in arabic and you know modern islamic philosophers a lot of them write in persian um i think yeah it been seen as metaphysics of the healing. The Kitab al-Shifa is available in English. But these are not very accessible books, even if they're in translation. Even if you know Arabic, they're not an easy read. So I'm going to suggest something in English, which also is not an easy read, but at least it's in English, which is the language that most people are used to, especially those who are watching this, this channel, since it is in English. And this is a book called Scholastic Metaphysics, a Contemporary Introduction by Edward Fazer. Again, Edward Fazer is a Catholic. He's writing from a scholastic to be more specific, Thomistic viewpoint, that is to say he's a follower of Thomas Aquinas. But uh, this is very readable and, and is very much in dialogue and, in, sorry, not, well, engagement, I should say, with, uh, with modern, uh, especially analytic philosophy. And then there's another book which he wrote that deals with um, Aristotle's understanding and of, of, of um, the metaphysical foundations of, of science. And so that's Aristotle's Revenge. Aristotle's Revenge. The Metaphysical Foundations of Physical and Biological Science. 
So it is important to understand metaphysical, the metaphysical principles that are at the background of what these people are talking about. So this has been a very, very long and detailed list. I have mentioned a lot of books which um, many people will find controversial for whatever, for this reason or that reason. But as I said before, it's very important to read very widely and deeply and read critically and come to your own conclusions. And so I hope that you find this list useful. Uh, please do let me know what you think in the comments. You can also email me. Do get in touch with me with your further suggestions. And I thank you very much for watching.